Kimberly Green, Sharp Program Manager for the Army Material Command, and Tim Roth, the Depot's Sharp Coordinator, are here this morning to discuss Sharp and Child Abuse Awareness. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Kim, are there specific trends occurring in the Army as it relates to sexual harassment or sexual assault? We find that a third of service members who were sexually assaulted say that their offender was previously harassed, sexually harassed them prior to the assault. We also have found that 8,000 males um, enter the Army each year having already been sexually abused. Uh, another <clears throat> highlight for that is historically more males experience sexual assault in the military more than women. However, women are more likely to report the offense. For DA civilians, what is the latest update regarding restricted reporting? So currently the, the current exception to policy expired in January. We were on a one-year trial basis. We had that extended until 8 March. That is now um, expired and there is currently one in front of the Secretary of the Army for signature to, uh, for another exception to policy. And then hopefully in the, long, in the long term, it will be written into policy for civilians to have the restricted option reporting. And speaking of policy, why is it so important that we have a zero tolerance policy for retaliation against those who report uh, harassment or assault? Sure. If we don't have a zero tolerance policy for retaliation, our military and civilian workforce will not report this type of behavior. We owe it to our workforce to provide them with a work environment which promotes dignity and respect. Reporting would hold perpetrators of these acts accountable. Okay, and what are the potential impacts to the individual or the organization if sharp issues go unchecked? So again, this would degradate our workforce, so this impacts the readiness of our workforce. By taking care of our soldiers, civilians, and families, we are providing a trained and more ready workforce to ex execute direct missions in support of our Army priorities and our missions. Okay, and, and Tim, uh, what are the main reasons that employees do not report sexual harassment behaviors in the, in the workplace? Well, we, we see a variety of reasons why uh, employees are um, reluctant to report. Um, of course, we always encourage a report, um, first and foremost. Um, but some of the reasons behind it, we notice that ambiguity can sometimes uh, come into play. Um, that, and we know that victims are a lot of times conflicted about what to do about a report, and, and so that ambiguity comes into play. Um, sometimes it's just a, a matter of conformity. Um, we have cultural norms and, and work section norms that, that take place, and so we have to educate our, our workforce continually about that issue of conforming to that um, possibly to toxic culture that might be out there. Um, and it's and to not conform to that, but to uh, be encouraged to report and to reach out to the assistance that's available in the community. Um, bystander apathy is also another issue. Um, a lot of times people think, well, it's just none of my business. You know, that's them carrying on doing what they do. That's, that's just Fred. That's just Sally. Um, and that bystander kind of um, apathy uh, takes place. Um, and they always assume that, you know, just somebody else will, will intervene um, and that, you know, I don't have to worry about that. Somebody else will take care of that. Okay. Well, let's talk about the uh, corrective actions for those who engage in sexual harassment here at work. Yes, ma'am. Um, there's a number of, of different avenues that management can take um, should there be some uh, pervasive actions um, on the uh, with an employee. Uh, termination, um, suspension, cancellation of uh, temporary promotions, things of that nature. Um, sometimes it could be a change to a lower grade or a written reprimand. Um, uh, sometimes it's just an issue where the, the supervisor needs to pull the employee in and, and do some counseling with that employee. Um, and then also we can do some retraining as well, and that's where the SHARP program would come in, and, and we can go in and, and, and provide some uh, targeted training for that work area. Okay. Are there any support systems available for our, for our workforce? There absolutely is. My office, the Sexual Assault Response Coordinator, um, is always there to support any employees that uh, would need to come and talk with us about their concerns. Um, Boyd Scoggins, our, your previous guest, he is one of our victim advocates. Um, and Wendy Suttles, uh, she works in the DO office. She's currently attending the 80-hour foundation course for SHARP, and she will complete that this week and will become certified, and she will also become another victim advocate that uh, employees can, can go to. Um, and then we also have a memorandum of agreement with Second Chance Downtown. That is our, our, our rape crisis center. 
Um, they can provide victim advocate services, and they're also our women's shelter for uh, domestic violence, uh, child abuse issues as well. Um, so, and, and in addition to that, our RMC, our local hospital, has a trained sexual assault nurse. Um, so uh, any victims of sexual assault can go to RMC to, um, you know, if they needed a rape kit um, or that uh, specialized care. We have a specialized trained nurse uh, within our community at RMC to uh, manage those, those cases. Okay, and, and it's safe to say that the goal is to eliminate sexual harassment and assault here by creating a climate that, that uh, forces us to treat everybody with dignity and respect. Absolutely. And again, this does enhance our, our material readiness. Yes, it does. Yes, ma'am. Okay, well, April, Tim, is also National Child Abuse uh, Prevention Month. On an average, how many children in our state are affected by this? Yeah, um, I, I was doing some research, and a 2017 report um, reports two years behind, just so they have all the numbers correct. And in 2015, there were uh, approximately 8,500 victims of abuse or neglect in Alabama. Um, and that's a rate of 8 per 1,000 children. And that uh, also includes approximately 13 child fatalities in 2015. Um, so, and, and one, one child death, obviously, is, is too many. Um, and uh, 8,500, that's, that's a pretty large number. So there's a lot of prevention needed across the state. Let's talk about the services that are available here on Depot to help parents. Yeah. Um, what we have is the Family Advocacy Program, um, which is the program that um, provides all of our uh, child and spouse abuse prevention efforts. Um, we can do anything from doing uh, couples enrichment training, uh, parenting training. We work very closely with our CDC staff uh, to ensure that uh, they are trained annually on uh, recognizing child abuse and, and what to do um, should, they, should they find those issues. So. Um, that support is here at the depot and again second chance is our uh, women's shelter um, if we need to refer victims uh, to uh, that uh, facility for housing needs um, we have that available as well um, and we also have a uh, memorandum of agreement with DHR so should there be a need to file a report of child abuse we work very closely with DHR um, and to ensure that uh, the right services and support are provided for that family Okay, and if employees have additional questions following today's show, who can they contact? They can contact my office at extension 7971, but I also have a 24-hour um, <clears throat> number. It's 256-624-8510, uh, and that's my 24-hour uh, hotline number.